Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight for our Wednesday night Bible study. It is good to be together. Enjoyed our meal downstairs. I do have several updates for you on our prayer list. Uh, Jean Jenkins fell on Monday and uh, hit her head. And she is at Deaconess Midtown in ICU. She's still having some blood pressure issues. Please continue to keep Jean in your prayers. Sherry Rashidian remains at home. She is still having some health problems. Please keep her in your prayers. And we want to extend our sympathy to Lynn Dawson and Mary McIndoo and all of their families on the loss of their mother, Sarah Riley. She passed away Sunday afternoon. Her visitation and funeral will be tomorrow at the Crittenden Drive Church of Christ in Russellville, Kentucky. Upcoming activities to tell you about, October King's copy is in the lobby. Please pick that up. Also, uh, I mentioned Jean being at the hospital. Terry's been out of the office, so October's worship assignments are prepared, but they haven't been mailed or emailed. There are copies sitting out there for all the men who are leading in the worship service. Pick up the, those worship assignments in the lobby. We'll eat breakfast together at Shoney's at 9.30 on October the 11th. Everybody is welcome. On October the 12th, the youth group will go play mini golf. The bus leaves at 1.45. See Josh for details. And this Saturday, Heather's parents are moving to Henderson. Herb and Carol Woolard, we're excited to have them here. If there is anybody available that could help with them unloading some trucks, see me. Uh, we'll be at 247 Tartan Drive in Highlander, and that afternoon those trucks would arrive and we could use some help. October 19th is Trunk or Treat. It'll be from 4 to 530 right here in the church parking lot. We need folks to sign up. If you'll be here to decorate your trunk, we need lots of cars that will be here to pass out candy. That is a community outreach event. We really push that and invite folks to come and check us out. So we need lots of cars here, but sign up and let us know that you'll be here to decorate your trunk and hand out candy. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby for that. Leading us tonight in our devotional service, Josh Terry has our opening prayer. Leland Steely is our song leader. I'll have our devotional, and Mason Douglas has our closing prayer. If there's nothing further, let's begin our worship time. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this time where we can come together in the middle of the week and, and sing praises to you, Lord, and, and study your word. Lord, we ask that uh, you be with all those that are mentioned on our prayer list. Uh, we pray especially for Jean as she is uh, suffering right now, and we ask that you uh, help the doctors see to her and, and figure out what is happening. Uh, Lord, we pray that you be with the, the Riley family and, and help them... Uh, 
and surround them and comfort them in only ways that you can, Lord. We're so grateful for the fact that you love us and the fact that you care about us enough to send your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I bring you greetings from Abby and uh, other friends at Harding. I ran into Tom Eddins. That's a name that some of you old timers will know from here. And Tom told him I was in Henderson, Kentucky. He said, that's my home church. So it was uh, good to see Tom and, and to see him again. But it, it's been a, a great time at the lectureship. I enjoyed the Harding lectures. Josh, thanks for preaching Sunday night. And while I was there, I got to hear a lesson from Orpheus Hayward that kind of got me to thinking. He was one of the speakers they had. And he mentioned having uh, had his parents look at him every once in a while when he was a kid and say, have you lost your mind? And I thought, hey, I've heard that too, you know. Um, I, I remember hearing that. And not only when I was a little kid, like as a teenager, I can remember a few times that was the introduction to a discussion. Have you lost your mind? And maybe even as an adult, every once in a while, I kind of wondered myself. And then I had kids and I suddenly found myself saying, have you lost your mind? It's usually a bad thing. And as Orpheus told his story of growing up in his house, he said, usually when my parents asked me if I had lost my mind, that was followed shortly by my father extending the right hand of fellowship to the posterior of my body for some corporal punishment. And when you ask somebody, have you lost your mind? What we really mean is, have you taken leave of your senses? Have your brains just fallen out? And it's a bad thing. But as Christians, Paul encourages us to lose our mind. He says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Paul says, my mind gets me into trouble sometimes. He says, I need to lose my mind. My mind is often concerned with just me and what I want and what works out for me and how my plans work. And I need to lose my mind and have the mind of Christ. My mind is often concerned with what other people think of me and, and, and am I doing right by them and is my reputation okay and I'm trying to manage all the, the social obligations and Paul says I need to lose my mind and have the mind of Christ. My mind tends to exalt itself but Christ doesn't hold on to his standing. My mind tends to want some other folks to do what I ask them to, to, to serve me but the mind of Christ is to serve others. And Paul goes on this great theological discourse. You read through that, and he talks all about Jesus, and he was in the form of God, but he didn't consider it robbery. He didn't think it was to, something to hold on to, to be equal with God. He made himself no reputation. But you get down to what did Jesus do? What does the mind of Christ do? And it's just one thing. Being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself. That's the mind of Christ. Paul goes through all of that to say, Humble yourself. My mind doesn't tend to humble me very often. Usually when somebody says, if you lost my mind, they're about to humble me. But, but I don't tend to do that to myself. But Christ humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation. He served others. He was obedient to God even to the point of the death of the cross. He lowered himself to raise us up. That's the mind of Christ. And so Paul encourages us, hey, lose your mind and get the mind of Christ. Lower yourself to lift others up. And so I would ask you this question. After all of that, let me just ask you, have you lost your mind? And maybe you would say, not yet, but I'm trying. Maybe tonight you would look at your life and say, you know what, I, I need to have the mind of Christ. I need to humble myself and serve so that I can lift others up. I, I need to make a change. Or perhaps you would say, you know what, I, I need to surrender my own will. I need to lose my mind and lose myself and proclaim Christ as Lord. I, I need to acknowledge him as Lord. And maybe tonight it's time for you to repent of your sins and confess your faith and be baptized. To have those sins washed away. Or perhaps tonight you say, I need to get my mind in the right place. I need to lose my mind and gain the mind of Christ, and I need the prayers of my brothers and sisters to help me do that.
If you need to come to the Lord or come back to him, if we can help you, won't you come right now as we stand and sing? Just as Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for all the many blessings you give us. Thank you for this church building that we have, that we can come worship you and sing songs of praise. Uh, be with us as we go to our classes. Let us learn more about you and keep a humble mind. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks for being in Bible class. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? O oh God, our Father, you are the God of creation. Thank you that you have literally been with us from the beginning, that your plan begins in the beginning. And Father, as we continue to study your will and your word, we pray that you would bless us with knowledge and wisdom to understand and obey and follow you. God, we come before you acknowledging that your way is right, your plan is best, your wisdom is so far beyond anything that we would ever come up with. Yet, Father, we also acknowledge that we have failed to follow your wisdom. That we have failed to follow not just your plan, but we have failed to love as you would love, to, to speak as you would speak. Father, we come and we confess our sins to you. We acknowledge that we have left your plan, and you're right and we are wrong in that. So, Father, we repent. And in our repentance, we look to you knowing that only you can fix that relationship. Thank you for the forgiveness that you offer us in Jesus Thank you that you paid for our sins. Thank you that Jesus came and lived that sinless life and gave it on the cross. And thank you that by his death, he restored what sin had taken from us. And in his resurrection, we have hope. Father, we pray as we study tonight that you would bless our time together, that everything we say and do here would honor you and glorify you, and that we would do that with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So throughout this time, we've been talking about some
some issues that, that people of religious groups talk about. And you get together with your friends and they say, where do you go to church and where do you go to church? And we begin to talk and have those discussions. And eventually we'll talk about some things we agree on and then some things we disagree on. And as we've gone through some of those issues, we talked last week about baptism. It's probably the biggest source of disagreement we have with a lot of different people and I laid out a biblical and historical foundation for baptism to, to help us understand why baptism is important and what scripture says about it. And let's say that maybe as you had studied that, you, you were really convinced, hey, I, I didn't believe baptism was that necessary or that important. I kind of thought it was something that you did eventually when you got around to it, or it was something some people did. And last week you said, man, I studied that material, David, and I'm convinced. I, I believe that baptism is, is the practice that every single person who wants to be saved needs to be baptized. If that's what you believe, then you say, but I got a few questions now. I, I want to know some more about this baptism. And, and perhaps, at least in my discussion with people, whenever we talk about baptism and there's some pushback and, and they'll agree to study, and these are people who love God and, and love his word, but we'll study through that and talk about baptism, and they say, wow, baptism is a lot more than I thought in Scripture but the pushback they first give is, hey, but what about the role of faith? Like, doesn't baptism, isn't that a work? And, and aren't we saved by faith? And, and if we're saved by faith and baptism is a work, then we're not saved by baptism. And they, they want to draw that, that distinction. And, and in fact, several of them would, would say, hey, you know, my preacher says we're saved by faith alone. And that's a, a powerful phrase. A lot of folks have heard that. Maybe you know that, that when Martin Luther started out talking about what we're saved by, he said we're saved by faith alone. And then later on he said we're saved by grace alone. And he has all these different solas that, that we follow. And, and he didn't ever see He said we're saved by all of these alone. And you say, well, Martin Luther, which is it? Because they can't all be alone. He's like, well, all of them are sufficient and they all work together. And the truth is when we talk about being saved by faith, we are saved by faith. And, and, but we're not saved by anything alone. We're not saved by faith alone. We're not saved by grace alone, scripture alone, not even by Christ alone. As you read about salvation, you realize that it takes those things working together, God's justice and his mercy. God's grace works in our life because of what Jesus did. That was part of the plan that God had made. And it does take a faith response on our part. In fact, scripture says we're saved by grace through faith, which is expressed in obedience, and even obedience is a gift of God from, or from God in Christ. And all of that is revealed in Scripture. The only way I would know about faith is in Scripture. And it's lived out in the works that we do as Christians. It's why people talk about the Christian life. It's not the Christian act. It's not the Christian moment. Well, that was my one little Christian time. No, the, the, the Christian life that we live. It's not a one-time decision. It is a lifestyle that, we're, that we lead. In fact, if you were to go through your Bible and say, hey, I want to find that faith alone verse, you would discover that faith alone is only used once in the scriptures. And I typically read to you from the New King James, and it uses the words faith only, but many of the translations will say faith alone. In James chapter 2, and verse 24 is the only time that phrase is used in Scripture. And what he says there is, after giving an example of Abraham and how Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, James says, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. That works and faith go together. You know James is the one who's going to make that case and say, faith without works is dead. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works, they go together. They, they require each other. We know that we are saved, that, that we are saved by grace through faith. Paul lays that out as he says in Romans chapter 5, in verse 1, he says, we've been justified by faith. He says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. He's got grace and hope and all of that. And he says faith is the key to it, but they all work together. And really we ought to ask the question of what faith is. And in my studies, that's usually a good time to when somebody says, hey, I'm saved by faith, say, what do you mean by that? What is faith? 
And so if someone in that, in that situation, if you say, hey, what is faith? What do you think faith is? I know if you grew up in church, you got the Bible class answer memorized, right? Believing without seeing. And then you went on to like junior high and you learned the big one. The evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for, yeah. But, but what is faith really? What does it mean? Believe, okay. Believe in what? Okay, believing in the gospel. So yeah, when we use it in a Christian faith, and JB's right, so if we just say faith, faith means belief. When I step on the brake pedal in my car, I have faith that that's going to trigger the brakes and they're going to stop my car. I, I have faith in the brakes. doesn't mean I'm looking to the brakes to save my soul, but in a Christian context, I believe. I believe in the gospel. So what is it I believe about the gospel? It's the way to find salvation. Okay. So I, I believe the answer is in the gospel. What's the answer that the gospel gives? Faith has got to be focused. Where do I look? If I say, hey, I believe in, you know, I, I got to have faith. I believe. I believe what? I heard it somewhere. Christ, yeah. So it's got to be focused on Jesus. And, and Lena says Christ. That's actually a really powerful word. I'm glad you said that. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Christ is a title. It's that Old Testament Messiah that God promised to send from the garden on forward. He said, you know, that, that, that there would be enmity between the seed of woman and, and between Satan. And, and he said that eventually the, that Satan would bruise his heel, but he would crush Satan's head. That's the first, that, that, that's the beginning of the gospel right there in the Garden of Eden. You trace it all the way through the Old Testament and, and you get to Matthew. And Matthew says, Jesus is the Christ. That's how Matthew lays out his beginning of his gospel. That's why he does that big, long genealogy to say this is all the promises. They've come together in Jesus. So faith has to be focused on Jesus. So I believe in Jesus. Well, you can say I believe Jesus was a historical figure. But it's another thing to say I believe Jesus is the Christ. That's a, that's a faith statement. But if I believe Jesus is the Christ that necessarily requires me to act, right? I have to. If you are walking down the railroad tracks, just having a grand old time and everything is quiet and you're just enjoying the scenery and somebody comes along and says, you have to get off the railroad tracks, a train is coming. And you say, there's no train coming. I don't hear anything. I don't see anything. You're making it up. I don't have to get off the railroad tracks. And if at that moment you see the light come around the corner and you hear the engine and you can see the train and you say, whoa, 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 I believe there is a train on these railroad tracks that's headed for me. What do you do? You get off the railroad tracks. So the moment I have faith, in that case it's faith by sight, when we talk about Jesus, there's a faith without seeing. But, but the moment I have faith, it changes how I act. So we see this all the time. We talk about faith in something we can't see. If I tell you, and, I, and don't get political on me, just be biological for a minute. If I tell you there's a brand new virus that spreads through the air, and if you're not careful, you can catch this virus, and you believe me, what are you going to do? Man, I'm going to be careful about being around. If they say, the folks who have this virus, here's the symptoms. They get all splotchy on their face. And I see somebody with a splotchy face. I'm going to back up and stay away. Why? Because I believe in something. I can't see it. I can't see that virus, but I believe in it. And it causes me to act different. So faith is believing, but it's belief that requires an action. It, it, faith works. Faith works. 
Paul starts and ends the whole book of Romans, and he talks so much about faith, but, but in the very beginning of Romans, he talks about the obedience of faith, and he brings that phrase up at the end of Romans as well. So this great book on faith ha- has bookended this phrase, obedience of faith. It means real faith works. And James would say if your faith doesn't work, it's dead faith. It's not really faith. And we know there are some great examples from Scripture. You know, when the Israelites uh, were wandering around in the desert, and, and here they are, they're, they're trying to follow God. They're in the desert. They've left Egypt, but they haven't made it yet to the promised land. Hebrews describes what happened there in the desert. Now, before I do that, let me ask you, why were they wandering around in the desert instead of going straight to the promised land? What's that? So Judy says unbelief because she's read Hebrews. But you know the story. What happened? So they complained against God. That's true. But that's not why God had them wander around in the desert. You could say, oh, they worshiped the golden calf. That's true. But that's not why God had them wander around the desert. What did they do that God said, you know what? 40 years in the desert. What was it? They got to the edge of the promised land. The spies go check it out. And God says, go. And they said, no. And God said, that's going to cost you. You can't tell God no. So they refused to do, because the spies came back. Remember, 12 spies went out. Ten were bad and two were good. Or ten were, yeah, ten were bad and two were good. There we go. VBS song. But, but you remember the ten spies come back and they have the bad report. And Israel said, hey, we're, we're going to follow them. We're not going to do what God said to do. We don't think that God can help us take that promised land. So we're not going. And they compounded it, actually. God said, that's it. Turn around. Head back out in the desert. And they said, no, 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 no. We're sorry, God. We'll go now. And he says, I'm telling you, don't go. And they took off. And they went. And it was terrible. And then they wandered in the desert. Hebrews describes all of that time in Hebrews chapter 3. The writer of Hebrews, skip down to verse... Let's start at verse 16. 18 and 19 is where we're going to end up. But verse 16, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? He says, look, these people, their sin was the sin of rebellion. All the Israelites, they failed to follow God. Verse 17, now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Remember, God said this whole generation, you won't get to enter the promised land. Because you doubted, because you didn't obey, you won't get to enter the promised land. Verse 18, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So what was their sin? They did not obey. Disobedience. Verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of disobedience. No, no, that's not what he says. What is it? Unbelief. Lack of faith. He says, what was their sin? Disobedience. See, they didn't go to the promised land because they didn't have faith. What is he equating there? What does he say is equal? Faith and faith. Obedience, yeah, works. He says they didn't enter in because they didn't obey, but then he says disobedience, that was unbelief. They're the same. We talked last week about Jericho. God said march around the city one time for six days and seven times on the seventh day. They did and the walls fell just like God promised. But if they hadn't followed God, it wouldn't have worked. If they decided on the third day, this is silly. Let's just do seven times a day and cut straight to the end. So did the walls of Jericho fall because of their obedience? Okay, straight up, I know, the walls of Jericho fell because of God. But on their part, (laughs) did God knock the walls down because of their obedience? Yeah, okay, fair enough. They did what he said to do, so he did. But Hebrews 11 verse 30 says, by faith the walls fell. Well, how do I know they had faith? One time, 
for six days straight. Seven times on the seventh day, I saw their faith in their works. They're together. They go together. Faith and works. Faith is expressed in obedience. For Israel, faith was required. They had to have faith. But faith required obedience. They went together. And it's the same for us. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, let's look at verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. What is it that makes us sons of God? Faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You are saved. That's what it means to be a son of God. You are saved because of your faith in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What's he say? What's the proof of your faith? How do I know you've got faith? Obedience, Obedience expressed in baptism in this moment. Paul says, you are sons through faith, as many of you as are baptized. So if you were to look at what Paul says there in Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27, and somebody says, well, you can't be saved by faith if you're saved by baptism, you'd say, well, Paul kind of says they go together. Paul unites those two terms. We are saved by faith, but baptism is necessary as part of our obedience. If I really believe, I'm going to obey and we talked last week how Jesus ties that into the very mission of the church and that great commission in Matthew 28. Go into all the world and make disciples. What's my job? Make disciples. What's your job? Make disciples. What's our job? Okay, good. We got to get on the same page. Every Christian's job is to make disciples. You say, well, Jesus, that sounds great. I'm going to go make disciples. He says, let me tell you how to do it. Go into all the world and make disciples. And he says, there's two things you got to do. What is it? He doesn't tell them that yet. In the Great Commission, he's going to tell them, you're right, you jumped to number two on me. He says, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So Jesus says there's two steps. Baptize them and teach them. Obviously, they've got to understand the gospel before they can be baptized. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. But, but they don't, the, the teaching doesn't end at baptism. But Jesus says, you want to be disciple makers? Good, because that's what every Christian has to be. And disciple makers baptize and teach. Man, it's that important. It makes it into Jesus' two-step summary of the whole mission of the church. And it is not a contradiction to say that baptism is an act of faith, that faith must express itself in that. Those two go hand in hand. When you understand what faith is in the Bible, it's like, okay, I get it. Faith is not just intellectual assent. I believe that two plus two is four, but I don't have to do anything about that. That doesn't motivate me to act, at least not until I'm counting change for y'all downstairs. But as a general rule, I, that's just a fact I believe. I believe that the Civil War really happened, but it doesn't motivate me to act. Faith says I believe in something that changes how I act. So if baptism and faith go hand in hand, then, then let's talk some more about baptism. Because the next thing somebody says is, hey, we baptize at my church, but it looks different. In fact, sometimes when, when people want to talk about baptism, they'll, they'll ask, how, how come you immerse? You know, my, my preacher just pours some water on her head or, or sprinkles some water on us. Why is it that we immerse? And this question, I, I love this question because it's a, it's a good one. The easy answer is because that's what the word means. The word baptize is not a Bible word. It's not even a preaching word. It wasn't used, to, in fact, first used for people. It's a military word. If you sent your Navy out and they came back and they said, hey, we met the opposing Navy. We sent out 50 boats and they sent out 50 boats. 
We baptized 50 of their boats, and they baptized 20 of our boats, so 30 ships came back to port. We won because we baptized more than they did. It was a competition, and that was how the Greeks would use the word baptize. What did they do to those ships? They, su- yeah, they immersed them. That's right. They sunk them. Okay, so, so when we baptize you, we bring you back up. But they didn't do that. They, they did that. I, I love the story of Nicander. Uh, Nicander is a Greek doctor. His reputation is fantastic. And lots of people talk about Nicander and his medical philosophy and all of that. But of all that Nicander did, we have stories about him, but only one thing survived that Nicander himself actually wrote. And it's his favorite pickle recipe. Nicander's pickle recipe survived. And in Nicander's pickle recipe, he says, here's what you do. You take your vegetables that you want pickled, and he's got his spices that you do, and you mix that with the vinegar, and he says, then you baptize them for three days in that vinegar. And you get the best pickle. That's how you make Nicander's pickles. Well, what did he do? He immersed them. We don't hold you under for three days either when we baptize you. But the word originally simply meant you immerse it in water. In fact, baptize is used even in the scriptures one time that clearly doesn't mean to immerse a person. It talks about baptizing your hands, and it's usually translated as washing your hands. When John shows up, he begins to preach And when he offers the invitation, he offers to baptize people. And he got a nickname, John the Baptizer. John, the guy that baptizes other people. In all of history, no one had ever baptized another person. The Jews had lots of baptisms that they practiced, but they were all ones you did to yourself. And so when you had to go bathe, hey, here were all the different, the, the mikvot that were out there, the, the big cisterns, and you, you would go down into that, and the priest might pray for you, and you might have folks, you would, you would offer an offering, but you baptized yourself, and John said, come here, I'm going to baptize you, and everybody said, that's really weird, you're John, the guy that baptizes people, and so he was known as John the baptizer. Now they had a different word. For sprinkle, the the Greek word for sprinkle is reino. You can see where we get our word rain. They didn't call John the sprinkler. They called him John the immerser, John the guy who baptized other people. And that's the word that they use. Scripture says we're buried with Christ. And immersion at baptism is a perfect picture of that. Just as Christ died and was buried and resurrected, so we are buried in that watery grave of baptism and come up out of it. Why is it we immerse? Because it's what the word means. And it's the the way that it's used. So who is eligible to be baptized? Well, when we talk about that, I always tell people baptism is for people who are accountable. If baptism is for a forgiveness of sins, then it's got to be for folks who, who have sinned. We teach our kids right and wrong, and we start that really early. One of those first words that kids learn is no. Where do they learn that word? Jerry says, I got no idea. Where do they learn to say no? They learn it from us because we look at them and say, no, no, don't do that, no. And they figure out what no means, and then we start to do something they don't like, and they look at us and they say, no, and then they learn some more. But we teach them right from wrong, because we want them to, uh, to, to be able to make those decisions on their own. And at some point, if you've raised kids, you, you know when they cross that line. If you remember being a kid, you know when you crossed that line. And it wasn't ignorance anymore. And what you did was rebellion, and you knew better, and you did it anyway. You thought you could get away with it, and when you found out you were wrong, you knew you were busted, you were accountable. At some point, which is unique for each person, someone with the mind of a child becomes accountable. They become able to decide good and evil, right and wrong, and And they are accountable for their decisions. And so baptism is for the accountable, but it's not just for the accountable, it's for the lost. Baptism, to come and say, hey, I want to be baptized, is to say, I am lost. 
I am without any hope in myself. Dying people need to be saved and lost people need to be saved. The only people we baptize are folks who would say, I am lost. And left to myself, all I can expect is judgment and condemnation from God. Because I have sinned and placed myself outside of God's will. I need to be forgiven. You see, if you aren't condemned, then you don't need to be forgiven. If you aren't guilty, then you don't have to worry about paying a debt. And so a person has to believe they're lost. I share this with parents a lot. If you grow up in church, you hear a lot of church talk, a lot of church words. At a very early age, you begin to understand some things that might be a little big for your britches. Preachers' kids are some of the worst about it, but kids that grow up in church, it's not uncommon to have a five-year-old or a six-year-old say, I'm a lost sinner and I need to be baptized. And boy, that, that if you raised your kids in church, there's a part of you that's excited, but also a part of you that says, hey, I don't know. You're a little young. And, and so when a parent comes to me with a young child, and by the way, I pretty much define young now as uh, anybody under 18, a child who says, hey, I want to be baptized, I always encourage, after we have a discussion, and I'll talk to them, and I'll say, hey, what do you think you need to be baptized for? Oh, I've committed sins. Well, what sins have you committed? And a lot of times I say, I don't know. Well, they're not accountable for anything. They just know you're supposed to get baptized, and they want to get baptized. But maybe they begin to say, hey, I, I do. I, I know some sins I've committed. And I know what ought to happen because of my sins. Well, now we've, now we've got a discussion because they said, I, I've messed up, you know. I lied to my parents or I, I stole a toy from my brother or sister or I hit my brother or sister. I, I've done stuff I wasn't supposed to do. I failed to do stuff I was supposed to do. They've begun to have a rudimentary understanding of right and wrong and to realize they've chosen wrong. We have a big discussion about that. And when it comes to a point where they say, you know what, I, I want to be baptized, and mom and dad say, we think this is a good idea, I always encourage that child to write themselves a letter. Write yourself a letter that says, hey, this is why I'm doing this today. This is what I think is going to happen to me when I become baptized. And write that, just write yourself a letter. And I take that letter, they give it to me, and I seal it up in an envelope, and I give it to mom and dad, and I say, you hang on to this. Because either there's going to come a day when they say, I don't know if I really understood what I was doing. And you hand them a letter and say, here's a letter you wrote the day you got baptized. Here's what you were thinking that day. And it helps them to make an informed decision. And I said, or sometime about 21 or 25, once that uh, frontal cortex is really developed and they can fully think like an adult, you hand them that letter and say, you know what, this will probably be pretty special to you to hang on to. Abby's letter says, dear future me, hi. I hope life has been good. And then she proceeds to talk about it. But, but whatever letter they write to themselves, it says, hey, here's what I was thinking. Why? Because I want to know if I was really accountable. You have to realize that sin has eternal consequences and that you're on the wrong side of it before you're ready to be baptized. Baptism is for the responsible. Because when you become a Christian, there are certain responsibilities that you inherit that come with that title. And anyone who wants to become a Christian has to be capable of fulfilling those responsibilities. Jesus warned you, you know what? Faith can cause you to separate from people. That, that you might have to separate because of faith, maybe even from family. And while certainly in our country that doesn't usually happen, we have brothers and sisters in some nations where that's an automatic thing. That they realize acknowledging their faith in Jesus will cost them their status in their family. Jesus also warned that anybody who wants to be his disciple should count the cost. So we ought to be able to count the cost. We ought to be able to understand what we're signing up for. And baptism is for those who are ready to make that commitment. It's a lifetime commitment. You know, we tell our children they're too young for things sometimes. We say, hey, you're too young to date. You're, you're too young to worry about that. And we don't ever worry that, hey, if we tell them they're too young to date, they might just grow up and never get married. They understand it's to happen later. When young children or those who are uninformed and, and unaccountable 
and don't understand what they're doing, want to be baptized, we're right to tell them they should wait. But hopefully we educate and teach them and walk with them until they reach an understanding and can understand the commitment they're making. And if we handle that with compassion, there's no reason to be afraid that somehow later on they'll hesitate when the time actually is right. Baptism is for those who understand. Gus Nichols used to say that to be baptized, you have to believe in the virgin birth of Jesus to Mary. Now, there was more to it than that, but he always said that because if you couldn't talk to him about a virgin birth, then he said you weren't old enough and mature enough to understand how a virgin birth could take place if you didn't understand how a natural birth could take place. That was his line. I'm not sure it's the best line, but he wanted you to say, hey, you've got to be able to understand the decision you're making. And that leads to the big question that most folks will ask. And, and I kind of summed this up for you last week. The, the basic summary question we'll get down to is, did mine count? Hey, I did something that was different from what I read in the scriptures. And, and so did mine count? I was baptized as a baby because my parents did it. I prayed a prayer. I responded to an invitation and, baptized, and was baptized when I was nine years old. Did mine count? What if, what if I was baptized for something other than the forgiveness of sins? What if, what, what if the folks that did it said it was, for, for, you know, it was after the fact that I'd been saved already? What if, what if, what if? Did mine count? And they've got all kinds of different reasons. Did mine count? I think Jack Cottrell says it best. It is obvious that our human tradition have seriously distorted and limited the light of Scripture concerning baptism and that many sincere people with good hearts have responded in good conscience to the light that they had at the time. And, and I told you, I, I used Dan Chambers' book, Churches in the Shape of Scripture, heavily for this. And in his book, Dan says, hey, we need to also affirm God has the final judgment. I, I wouldn't want to speculate on how he'll judge each person who has sincerely responded to an inaccurate teaching about baptism and salvation. I'm glad I don't sit on that throne. And while I can say I'm comfortable trusting him to make the best decision, I can't ever advise somebody to go against what Scripture teaches. And so if somebody comes and says, what should I do? I'll teach them what Scripture says. I'll teach them how Peter answered that question, how Ananias answered that question to Saul, how Paul tells us to answer that question. And while I certainly hope that God in his grace and mercy and justice will cover a lot of people who responded differently, and I'll be the first one to celebrate when he does, if somebody says, hey, what should I do? I should always move to step in line with what God has shown us in Scripture. And while I, I know what I hope will happen, I still preach God's simple plan, and Scripture is full of examples of sincere men and women who came to a point where they realized by the grace of God that they were sincerely wrong. And in that moment, because they were sincere, they corrected their course. They said, hey, I, I thought I was doing right. Paul is probably one of the best examples. I thought I was doing right. He said, I did everything I did as a Pharisee with a clear conscience right up until the moment that the voice said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then I realized I'd been wrong. And Saul changed his course. And so those who followed the scripture's teaching about salvation, those who have faith have always said, you know what? If I believe, I'll obey. And if I ever reach an understanding on any issue that, hey, what I was doing was out of step with God's will, I'm going to obey. I'll change what I'm doing. If you and I were to read scripture and say, you know what, church is supposed to meet every single day. And somehow, you know, we look at that example in the New Testament and, and let's say that, that we said, I, I don't know, we've read it this way all our lives, but somehow we reach a conclusion together. God's will is that the church should gather every single day. What would we do? We'd be here tomorrow and the day after that. we gather. Why? Because faith obeys. And we would change course. If we ever said, wow, I was wrong, I would change course because faith obeys as we come to understand the word of God more clearly with more maturity we change our practices to line up with what we believe God teaches us in scripture 
And so the, the last thing that, that I always like to conclude with when we discuss baptism, and I hope as you talk with people that this is where you will land as well. God never wants us to wonder if we're saved. Very early in my ministry, in fact, I was still in grad school and I was still an intern, and the preacher asked me to go and visit one of the little old ladies at our church that hadn't been able to get out very much anymore. Her body just wouldn't let her leave the house much at all, but not for worship, not for anything else. And she felt really bad about that. This is pre uh, internet days, pre online services, anything else. She would listen on the radio, and that was, that was about the best she could do. And so I went to visit with her. And as we talked, I said, Tell me how you became a Christian. And she told me about her life and how she had become a Christian at a very young age. And she and her husband had served God faithfully together. And they'd done so much with young people growing up. And then she had been a teacher for years and years and years and years and years. She was one of those ladies that just taught forever. And finally, when she couldn't teach anymore, she and a young mom taught together for about five more years where she couldn't do everything, but she had a helper. And I actually knew that. Now she was a much older lady. She was still teaching. And I visited with her and I thought, wow, look at your life. Look at what you have been able to do. And she said, my big fear, and she started to cry. She said, my big fear is that if I got out driving one day, she said, I might run off the road and hit a tree or worse yet, hit somebody. And she said, I might think a dirty word that I know I'm not supposed to say. And she said, if I were to die, and I'd heard stories about people like this, and I, it happened to me. She said, I'm afraid if I thought a dirty word and then I died, God would send me to hell because I didn't have time to repent. And, and at this point, tears are just rolling down her cheeks. Now, I, I was young. And I, I needed some help. I got back and went to my mentor and said, what should I have said? And, and he helped me an awful lot. God doesn't want us to live in fear like that. That somehow a lifetime of service is wiped out with one moment where I just didn't even have time to repent before I faced him in judgment. That bell is early. All right, here's what you need to know. God says specifically, he wants us to be saved. John writes the book of 1 John specifically to Christians who wonder about their salvation a little bit. And so here's the verse I want you to know. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Another time I was preaching and I said, Raise your hand if you died right now and you know you would go to heaven. Raise your hand. And in a group of church people, maybe 15, 20 of them raised their hand. And afterward, a few folks chastised, we can't know. And I said, John says you can. That you can stick that hand up high and say, absolutely, God will keep his promise to me. God is faithful that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. God wants us to be certain of our salvation. His plan is clear and simple. He invites us to follow it. And part of why he does that is so that we can know and be sure. It is one of those blessings of God, the confidence that comes, not because we earned it, not because, hey, I checked off all the boxes, but because God is faithful. And he said, here's what I'll do. And so we followed him. When people in the New Testament came to a belief in their heart that they were not saved, they took action. They were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, and they told other people about the gospel and the salvation that Jesus offers. They made disciples, because that's what Jesus said was the mission of the church. We're going to take a look next week at our worship service and some of the practices we have there. We're going to talk about our singing. I'm kind of excited about that. And we'll talk about why we sing and how we sing and what, what a difference our singing makes. Thanks for being in Bible class this Wednesday night.